Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to um, University College Galway, the National University of Ireland Galway. Gomeni Giugoiva Guinushla, Algasis Onor Mordom, Hura Horivsha, and Shah Gohal Scalian Galiva in you. Beme Ido Hahir Luk Irihinle. So I will be your chairperson today. Um, my name is Fidelma Healy Eames. I'm a, I'm a local girl. I'm from Galway. And um, I have a few roles, but they're all fairly self explanatory on the, on the paperwork in front of you. I'll be ably assisted today by Seamus Callan. Seamus is my co chair. Uh, Seamus is a teacher in, uh, in the Bish in Galway. He teaches DCG, English and lots of other things. But what's really interesting about Seamus is he was a former engineer. And it's often a career move we don't hear about, where you go from engineering to teaching. And he's the former president of the alumni here in Galway, in, in UI Galway as well. Look, it's a really exciting day, and this is your day. And this is a very special day, and you can see that um, I, when people were asking me, who is present at the conference? And all I could say is, it's like a veritable map of Ireland. People are here from all over the country, and that's wonderful. Largely, I guess in education, we also have some people that, that are parents specifically here, and we have a really interesting group of young people, of students, because guess what? Today is about students, and it's about our young people. So I want to welcome the students from Kaloshtha and Akuraba, here in Galway City, from Calasanctius College in Oran Moor, um, from Colosh de Balliaclar in Clare Galway. Could you give me a wave, Colosh de Balliaclar? Oh, fantastic. And from the Bish, we have a student as well, and from Salerno. We also have students from GMIT and from NUIG. And we ran a little competition, so they all earned their spot on the basis of producing a learning idea that would make learning easier for themselves or others. So perhaps at some point in the day, they may wish to share. Um, look, in terms of housekeeping, we're going to run now till 11 o'clock for your coffee break, and then lunch will be in the Bielan, and Susan, Susan, you might give everybody a wave. Susan is my assistant, and Geraldine at the desk, and they will be helping direct people to the various places. Um, Right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to kick off because we're already running a little bit behind time. I'm, particularly gr I'm really grateful to all of the panellists and speakers we have today, but we'll introduce them one by one, and to the various supports that people have given us to make this conference possible. I'm going to get started by introducing our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Dr. James J. Brown. And he became the 12th president of Inuai Galway on the 6th of March 2008. A native of Athlone County, Westmeath, and an engineering graduate of Inuai Galway, Jim Brown is a former dean of engineering, and may I say, with a very strong interest in mathematics, because we've had this discussion ourselves about the teaching of maths. I want to just say to you that I am really grateful up front in introducing the president to you, that he provided me with this venue today. And unless we had this venue, I'm not so sure that the conference would be happening. So look, it's my great honor to thank the president for your generosity in providing the venue and for opening, doing the opening welcome. Dr. James J. Brown. <laughs> Magbeth, Agus Hafalcho of Galair, Hermagen, Yanador, Irara, Kolaka, Akorja, Oxy, and Especiata. Can you hear me? Yes. While I'm reduced from weeks to go on with Galair, I saw the chance of Hortham, Couple of Fokler, Olive, Egas, Okod, Sun Sukshaw. I'm still on the manager of Antanyev, Agus Antolta, as on law. As, 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 as. Let me say, first of all, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this morning to this important event. It brings together lots of different people, as, as Senator Hebe Eames has said representatives right across the spectrum of second and third level education. Teachers, lecturers, <coughs> students, and students are very welcome to this, it's good to have the student voice heard. Parents, school leadership, members of education and training boards, 
politicians, journalists and indeed business and social leaders. I want to particularly welcome our guest speaker, Professor Pazzi Salberg from Finland. I think we look forward to his observations on reform in education and certainly his experience worldwide is, is, an, is an important, I think it offers important possibilities for us in terms of insights into what's happening in education reform. The conference is clearly very timely because I think it's widely recognised that we are in an area near of reform. And I think our former minister led that reform for many years. I think we're grateful to him for that. He set in train lots of, lots of interesting reforms which I hope we will see to completion in the next few years. So this, this conference offers an opportunity for a real engagement and dialogue around a set of core questions. And those questions, to my mind, are as follows. Are we preparing our young people to meet their own needs, to meet the needs of our society, to meet the demands of the workplace, indeed to meet the demands of a changing Ireland? It seems to me there's a fundamental question which faces our society, and that is how we prepare citizens for our future, for, for our own society. I think education has a huge role to play in answering that question. It's also a question which is getting more complex and more difficult to answer as time goes by. I put it to you that we are in an era of tremendous change in terms of our society. And that change has been captured by at least one well-known author, Robert Putman. He published a book in the year 2000, and that book was entitled Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. In that book, he surveyed the decline of what he called social capital in the United States since the 1950s. He describes in great detail, I think very convincingly, how various forms of personal social interaction upon which Americans built their society, upon which they built their whole ideas, they, how, how they educated their own, their own children, how they enriched their own social fabric, all that form of social intercourse is being gradually eroded. And his central thesis was that the lack of active civic engagement is a threat to democracy and is a threat to our society. Much later, in the last couple of years, Niall Ferguson, British historian, in his BBC Wright Lectures in 2012, he published subsequently a book based on those lectures. That book was called The Great Degeneration, How Institutions Decay and Economies Die. Again, I think he argued very convincingly that a key part of the generation is the weakness in civil society. He argued that civil society is critical to the development of our, our, our civilization and our democracy. He also argued, as Putman did, that the death of traditional association and associative life in our society is a threat to our society. He points out, for example, that Facebook, that virtual social network, that creates huge societies with very little depth. Lots of breadth and no depth. And I, I would argue that those two authors, Ferguson and Putman, what they're fundamentally saying is that our society has become atomized. Our sense of a shared common consciousness has been eroded. Think of how, for example, young people interact with society today, how they choose to interact. In many ways, they create their own virtual societies the old birds of a feather style model, where people come together with common interests. They almost join what you might call tribes, sort of groups which are based around, for example, football <coughs> fan clubs, chat rooms, face group, Facebook and LinkedIn groups and all this. They plug in their devices and they walk through society unconscious of, the, of what, where, they're, where they are. They're, living in a, in, they're walking through the streets of Galway but listening to a, perhaps a, something from who knows where it's coming from. The point I'm making is that the notion of a shared public space is being gradually eroded. And that, I think, is, is really fundamental to our traditional democracy and our traditional society. I think it's a the question that has been posed by Putman and restated by Ferguson is one that we need to keep in focus. And I would say that in face of that challenge, we need to rethink how we build our citizens, how we build citizenship, and how we, if you like, educate young people to be active, engaged citizens in a future democratic society. How to reimagine a democratic society, if you like, faced with all these challenges. Fundamentally, we must try to create a shared sense of community, a shared model 
which is the basis of any democratic society. This university understands that issue and is trying to address it. We're trying to address it through a set of initiatives. I'll mention one or two of them. A very important initiative here is an initiative called ALIVE. ALIVE stands for a learning initiative and volunteering experience. And fundamentally it's about encouraging our students to engage with society in a volunteering way, working with lots of different groups inside and outside the university, indeed inside and outside of Ireland, ranging from engagement with clubs and societies in the university to engagement with Samaritans, with Cope and Galway, with the Chernobyl Children's Fund, with all of those organisations which require support and where students learn by supporting them. We promote that notion, we promote that notion of pro bono volunteering in order to create active engaged citizens, in order to inculcate in our students a sense of involvement in community, to try to ensure that when they, when they go out into the world as professionals, whatever, teachers, engineers, architects, whatever, that they also understand their role as part of a wider society and they don't retreat into their own little professional niche, but they engage fully and become volunteers and become people who are contributing to and engage with all strands of our society. We engage in service learning, encourage our academics insofar as it's possible to bring into the classroom opportunities for students to learn outside the classroom and to value that and to value that in terms of credits. And that, is, I think, has been quite successful across the institution. We developed a youth academy to bring in younger students from primary school into university to have our staff engage with them, to give them some sense of, if you like, the continuum of education from primary through into, the, through into third level. Having said all that, we realise, of course, that skills are also necessary. We're not naive. We realise that students need more than that. We know that skills are at the heart of the academic mission, so we do our, our best and we try to ensure that the university also creates graduates whose skills are, ne are, need are, are, are valued and needed by our society. In the area of education, for example, there are a number of big initiatives underway here. We have engaged strongly with the teacher, initial teacher education program that, that the minister, former minister launched some years ago. We've engaged, for example, in the new prof uh, prof professional master in education, the recast HDIP as it was called. We have the Master of Governments and Educus with the BA in Mathematics and Education to produce maths teachers through a four-year program. We've engaged fully with the agenda around rationalization across the provision of education and teacher training. We are actively engaged in, in uh, consolidating St. Andrew's College into this university and that I'm happy to say is progressing very well. We've recently sound, so, sound, so, sorry, we recently signed an agreement with St. Angeles on how we will integrate St. Angeles into this university and that's now gone to the department for ratification. We anticipate when that is completed that this university will be producing 400 teachers per year right across the range I mentioned. Most, the teachers the teachers in mathematics and, and the masters in education. We also recognise the importance of, of technology to education and our colleagues in the, in the School of Education have been active in promoting that one of our colleagues, Sean O'Grawley, was recently invited to the Apple Faculty Speaker Series in London to present his work on the use of technology in, 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 if you like, in engaging teachers and pupils, developing systems to allow the creation of apps to support education and an active education, education in the sense of teachers and pupils working together. So we, we, are, we are, I think, engaging with the challenge of education. We appreciate that the challenge is to produce good citizens who are also part of a well-trained and educated workforce. We also understand that there are, uh, there are many people who can offer us good insights in this area, and we look forward particularly to the, to the uh, insights of Professor Salberg based on his, his experience in Finland. He has argued that less is more in terms of teaching time, that better learning and less teaching, sorry, less testing is relevant. He has argued for equity and equality through diversity, and he's also argued strongly for the promotion of teaching as a profession valued by society. We certainly look forward to hearing his observations on today's discussions. I certainly find his comment that the Finnish experience, which adopts a holistic approach, both in content and across the life course, is a, is a very seminal observation, one which I think addresses the issue of citizenships and skills, and one which addresses the notion of preparing pupils and students for life and work at all stages of their lives. So with those few words, can I again welcome you all to the university.
thank Fidel Mahilian for her tremendous effort in organising this event, this, this tough, serious organisation, and I appreciate that, and I, I'm delighted that we, the university was able to help her in providing, a, in providing a facility for it. Wish you well. Wish you a very both productive and enjoyable day. And just point out to you that the, the initial event here was scheduled for a much smaller room. And a measure of the success and the interest in this, in this event is that we had to move to such a large room to, in order to accommodate all those who are interested. So please, have a good day. I'm Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, if there's people who are in late there, if you'd like to move in, and uh, everybody, gets everybody get, there's plenty of seats, so in the middle, we'll just let you. Okay, um, just before I, I introduce our next speaker, I'd just like to thank President Brown for his address and thank him on behalf of the te teaching profession for what he's done for teaching in NUIG and the initiatives he's taken for teacher education in NUIG. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, first keynote speaker, and that's former Minister for Education, Rory Quinn. An architect and a town planner by profession, uh, Roy Quinn is a graduate of University College Dublin and who taught design for more than 10 years. In his 40 months as Minister for Education and Skills, he saw the introduction impl and implementation of radical reforms. These included curriculum reform at junior cycle, a new five-year transparent capital schools building programme, provision for diversity and pluralism in the patronage and the primary school network, and to meet the changes in modern Ireland and the radical uh, reconfiguration of third level education to meet the needs of Ireland as a knowledge based economy. These reforms and changes, though challenging and controversial, have been politically uh, accepted and are in the process of being implemented. He continues to represent Dublin Bay South and particularly maintain a keen interest in all matters educational. Fidelma, in her introduction, mentioned that I had a background in engineering. And when I worked in, in that, we dealt a lot with architects. And architects really are dreamers, we're visionaries, you know. And I hope you don't mind me saying that. But really, the, the architect is the guy who comes up with the inspiration, the dream for what uh, things should look like, for how we go on with our building, for how we go on with our societies and that. And it's the engineer's job to try to put the architect's vision into place. And education needed its dreamer. It needed its visionary, you know. And controversial as it may seem, it's the dream and vision of Mr. Quinn that has us all talking here today and has us discussing uh, these changes in education. And it's, the, it's his dream that has us talking about our own house, about the creaky front door and the leaky roof and maybe in the Jane Gene Gene Eyre scenario, the mad woman that's locked in the attic. <laughs> and maybe we need to talk about these things and bring them out into the open and discuss them. So it's my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce Minister, our former Minister, Mr. Rory Quinn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seamus. I, I have to start with the following anecdote. I was late in applying for UCD School of Architecture back in the last century. Uh, those young people in the room were looking at points and I just won't believe how informal it was. So I didn't get into UCA and I started in Bolton Street. And five weeks later, I was told informally that somebody had dropped out of architecture in UCG to do engineering, and would I be interested in applying, which I did, and had a very full university life. But as luck would have it, didn't I meet the guy who left the slot that I filled in a canning factory in Essex in England, making summer money. And after a long conversation, Seamus, you might be interested in what he said. When I put to question, I said, why did you leave architecture to do engineering? apropos of dreamers. He said, I couldn't hack the idea that there was no correct answer to the question. <laughs> Look, 
you're all involved in education, and we stay involved in education right through our lives. Uh, I just want to focus on one thing that I, on reflection, think are the weak links between the various stages, which can very much affect the quality of how the entire education experience is uh, had and put to the use that Professor President Jim Brown spoke about. We have a formal structure called primary, post-primary, used to be secondary, and vocational, when there was that apartheid divide, if you like, and then third level, and then lifelong learning. And really, those structures, which have a historical background, determine how excellence is achieved in the spaces which they occupy, but where the transition or the movement from one to the other can be faulty because nobody's really responsible for it. Uh, so I want to just say to you, if we were to start today, would we have primary, secondary, post-primary, and third level? Uh, would we relate it to the growing experience? Would we have early childhood? Would we have children? Would we have teenagers? And would we have adulthood? And if you look at the evidence-based research that Emer Smith and our colleagues in the SRI have found, is right in the middle of one of those transitions, the junior cycle of second level or post-primary, which is a politically correct word for bringing the two together, but it is uh, secondary, uh, in and around the age of 14. In other words, in second year, sometime depending on the bodily growth of the young person, male or female, there is a certain disconnect. And the, the, the system begins to fail to recognize the span of interests, abilities, and talents that young people have. And that's something that we we are not fixing, and one of the things that we're trying to do with the junior cycle, and over time it will settle down and will be fixed, uh, will we'll address that particular issue. But we cannot ig ignore the evidence that the system is wonderfully succeeding some people, but actually not helping a lot of other people. And in an article that I wrote earlier this week for the uh, education part of the Irish Times, I go into that in some detail. So that's, that's one area where I think we have a, sis a transition systems weakness. Not failure, because it's not failing, but it is weak and it is certainly failing some people. I want to give an example of another kind of transition system weakness, and I acknowledge here the presence of the president of uh, Maynooth University, uh, Philip Nolan, who's in charge of looking at uh, how the transitions from second level to third level can be dealt with. The <clears throat> happened to get on the train yesterday with a, a colleague of mine from Leicester House. I was asking him how his son was. He's doing the Leaving Cert this year. And he wants to do a particular course. And he said, uh, well, I want to go to Dublin to do this course. And the suggestion was, well, why would you like to go to your hometown where there's a university, where they actually have the same course? And he said, ah, yeah, but you know, you only need 400 odd points to get into that course. And you need 550 points to get into the course in UCD. Therefore, the course in UCD Ergo, must be better. Mm -hmm. Non sequitur. No logical reason for it at all. Now, in a way, there's a lot of professional educationists in the system, and I've worked with a lot of professional educationists in our system, and we have a very good education system by international standards. And that's not a political observation for me because I don't have to anymore. But if you look at where we are in a whole host of areas, in a paper that I gave on Monday night, there was a study done by Gareth Fitzgerald that looked at the spend on education as far back as the first two decades of the 1800s. The first two decades of the 1800s. And it demonstrated that the spend in so far as it could be measured in Ireland was extremely high in education. And what I did with Gareth's paper was to overlay the current European Union per capita income, uh, the rich areas of the European Union and the poor areas of the European Union. And there was a virtually a direct correlation. Now, the statistics were very ropey. You wouldn't meet the standards of uh, scientific analysis today. But insofar as you had any indication, there was a clear correlation between investment in education and outcomes over generations. And we are the lucky inheritors of an investment, cultural, emotional, parental time, and money into the education system. But we are weak, I believe, in making sure that we have a joined up educational system that successfully goes from preschool to primary, from primary into junior cycle and then into senior cycle, into course selection, and how the effect of the points race and the little anecdote that I gave to you is filtering back into the system 
where a really inspirational educator who's teaching English as a senior subject for the leaving is confined to maximizing the outcome because the parents and the sons and the daughters measure the successful outcome by how many points they actually get. Now, this is a problem that I believe can be fixed. But because it's nobody's responsibility and people will retreat into their own sort of areas of um, occupation or training or trade union representation, for example, there's no union for, for transitions. There's the primary schools union and the two unions in the second. And then the, we have these weak links. And I'm going to finish at this point. Just as you're going through today's interesting array of speakers, ask yourself, how better will this contribution make the passage from preschool to primary, from primary to junior cycle to senior cycle, and on into third level, and on into the rest of your life? Because quite frankly, you never stop learning. Uh, in the career that I chose for myself voluntarily, we had exams every three or four years. We call them elections. Sometimes you get bad marks. <laughs> Sometimes you get bad marks, sometimes you get bonuses, uh, sometimes it, it changes. But we're all being tested all the time, formally or informally. And I would just say we have a good system. We have a wonderful respect for teachers that many countries would die for. Uh, we take it for granted that teachers are well respected and are well trained. Uh, the Secretary for Education across in the United Kingdom is wondering whether in fact uh, teachers should have a third year added to their two-year primary school teaching. And the, the, the final point I would make is that the Teaching Council now, and it's represented here by Tomas O'Rourke and others, uh, we have no unqualified teachers in our classroom anymore. As a result of the registration that started in January of this year, to be paid by the state and to be in a primary or a secondary school classroom, you have to actually have a qualification. That is abnormal worldwide abnormal worldwide compared to, to this country. So let's start with the good achievements that we have and fix the transitions. Thank you.